You're listening to the Cricket Podcast. Hello everyone and welcome to the Cricket Podcast where today we're going to be talking about the mega series that was England 2, Sri Lanka 0. Then after after that emotional high, uh, we'll move on to previewing the Pakistan-England series. We'll talk about South Africa sealing victory in a T20 series in the Caribbean. What does that mean? Are they the dark horses for the T20 World Cup now? Uh, we've got some women's cricket. There's three T20s to go. England v India. It's, it's delicately poised. England slightly on top there. The 100 draft. We've got the, we, we actually know who's going to be playing for sure now. We, we're going to run through that very quickly. And James Anderson has just taken his thousandth international international wicket. Uh, first class Wicket, I'm Jack Hope. Today I'm joined by Max Ray Brown. Which of those topics, Max, are you most excited about talking about? Uh, which one will be done the quickest? James Anderson? <laughs> <laughs> and we're joined by Dan Weston. Dan, same question to you. Uh, as a, a, a smorgasbord of cricketing delight, what, what are you most interested in, in talking about today? Well- as I work for a hundred team, I really should be the most really looking forward to that, and I and I am. I can't wait for the tournament to start. But I, I don't think anything peaks me talking about how bad Sri Lanka have been. Over <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! I, it's it's a shame. It's a shame. Nobody really wants to see an international cricket team to pitch up and, well, effectively be, you know, we, we were just saying off here, unlikely to be competitive at, at county standard. Uh, but that's what we saw, and we are going to talk about it, and we're going to try and where we can be, be positive uh, towards Sri Lanka. Um, although that could be a bit of a challenge. Before we do get into the body of the show, though, Max, do we have any messages for our listeners? Yep, as always, you should uh, like and subscribe to the Cricket Podcast on YouTube or whatever podcast platform you uh, decide to uh, devour us on. And uh, you can follow us on social media at the Cricket Pod on Twitter and Instagram. And you should head over to Patreon, patreon.com forward slash the cricket pod, uh, and get involved there. You can get yourself a hat. Um, we said we would do a roll of honor, and we actually do need to put that together because a couple of people have um, Patreon up to the level, which requires a roll of honor. So, uh, Max, we'll have a discussion about that. Uh, and maybe we'll just do shout outs for anyone that, that you know, gives us three pounds or whatever yeah. the lower limit is. Well, we can do that. We can spare the seems, air. Seems like a, a reasonable <laughs> sacrifice from our point of view. <laughs> exactly. Um, Max, England v Sri Lanka. And what are we going to do here? Should we go through it game by game, do the talking points as they come up? Does that sound good to you? Yep, I think so. Well, I have, that's good, because I have a write-up of the first match. and I'm, I'm going to basically read that out now. So prepare to be engaged by uh, an absolute classic. Um <laughs> If you do say so yourself. In the first match of the series, England, they won the toss and um, decided to bowl. And now you could tell before the game that this was probably going to be a bit of a steamrolling because the the the, the commentary at the Twitterati uh, were more or less saying that England should bat first here just to make the game interesting. Uh, and, you know, I'm not sure they were wrong um, because it was, it was a bit of a shame, certainly for the people who paid to turn up and watch the match that England bowled first. Um, Because they were a bit too good for them. Chris Wokes, in particular, was fantastic with the new ball. And despite a spirited fight back from Kusal Pereira and Wanindu Hasaranga, uh, England, well, they basically blew Sri Lanka away uh, for a total score of 185. Now, in fairness to Sri Lanka, that was significantly better than any of their T20 totals. So um, they, they can... They can pat themselves on the back for that. In response, Johnny Bairstow, he went off like he double parked his car uh, and possibly had half an eye on uh, the England football team's round of 16 match with, with Germany, I think. Uh, and it looked for a little while like he he was on course to break some records. Um, unfortunately for him and anyone who had a lingering interest in the outcome of that match, uh, he was out for 43 off, off just 21 balls. Uh, from there, England had a little bit of a wobble as the Sri Lanka bowling side once again, once again asked a few questions. Um, again, they come out of this whole debacle with a little bit of credit, I think. Uh, but the sure hand of Joe Root saw England home. Uh, as he top scored in the match with 79 not out. England won by five wickets with 15.5 overs to spare. Um, normally, I have a few questions to, to go on to after I've done one of these um, little intros. Uh, today, I don't really have anything. The question I've got is, 
I'm not sure what we learned from this game. Question mark. Dan, <laughs> help. <laughs> well, I, th- I think we can not just talk about this game. I think we're just talking about the series yes. as, as a whole. We've learned nothing. Um, Sri Lanka, if you look at them on paper, that they, they were a, a poor team and they've certainly not disappointed at that, that assertion. Um, as we said, probably worse than a county team. Uh, the vast majority of the players. I mean, if you look at who would get in a county team as as, as an overseas player, I think it's probably pretty fair to say that the Hasaranga would be the only only player who would do that. And we've learned nothing from England because they just pick the same team no matter what. In my opinion, it's not far off a closed shop, basically. Um, we don't see new players coming in who have done well. You know, let's, let's take, take a moment, right? We've got the T20 World Cup in the winter. Let's say... A, a young player who maybe had a half decent year last year went and hit 500 runs in the blast at strike rate of 200 this year. Are they going to get called up? Absolutely not. So that's like the equivalent of like Finn Allen's season in New Zealand last year. And he's now in the national team. You wouldn't do that with England. It's harder to get out of the team than it is to get in the team. And I think the, uh, the continued usage of Tom Curran kind of illustrates that as well. Is that necessarily a bad thing though, Max, do you think? it being harder to get out the team than get in. That's what they used to say about the great Australian side in the late nineties, early two thousands. Mm. Um, the, th- I think ultimately it's a, it's a good sign to have consistency, isn't it? You were, uh, we've, we've gone from one extreme to the other really with England, haven't we? In, in the early two thousands, you've got, uh, it's basically a revolving door of people coming in and out and someone fails after two games and you try someone else. So I think it's uh, it's good to have um, some sort of consistency. And I, I don't think, you know, Tom Curran aside, I don't see a reason um, to mess it up. I, th- I think, you know, if you've got you've got a squad there that's basically the squad that, that won the World Cup, um, you, I, I don't see why you would change it with uh, a big tournament on the horizon. I suppose the, the dif- you know, there's a, the slight difference being that this is one day cricket compared to, to T20. And um, there might be a bit more scope to, to play around with things for the T20s. But I, th- I think for... Um, for me, what I think is even more perplexing about the uh, these these series is that they've given equal weighting to one day games and T Twenty games. We've got three of each. I'd much rather see four and two or something like that. I, I don't. I mean, it's you. You got to keep playing some one day cricket. You can't just forget about it because obviously it still exists. And they brought back the uh, Champions Trophy and, and, and that kind of thing. But with the T Twenty, the spectre of the T Twenty World Cup on the horizon, you might as well play as much as you possibly can. Mm. And also, when there's that either, <laughs> when there's such a mismatch of teams as well, the shorter the format, the the more chance there is of of a surprise result. Yeah, um, I mean T10. I'm not sure that much would change, but maybe Sri Lanka if they had a bowl out, it might it might <laughs> it might improve their fortunes a little bit. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I mean I don't know what else is there to add on this i mean i guess on the selection debate owen morgan did talk about this a little bit he was questioned um for some of the decisions uh, they'd made particularly i think not picking george garton he said he didn't want players coming in for one match um which i think is his way of saying the we know our best team and we're not going to accept anyone else coming in even if they do have score 500 runs in the blast it's not it it is a bit of a closed shop Um, and the other thing he said was that the reason they picked George Garton in the first place and then brought Tom Bannon into the squad for the final uh, match of the series uh, was that they just got some experience being around the team. Like they didn't need to be on the pitch, just, just being in the environment. Apparently it's a, it's a thing about easing people in. They use that a lot, don't they? They use that excuse when they um, dragged, uh, dragged poor old Matt Parkinson (laughs) all the way over to, uh, to the subcontinent for, for three months and then didn't use him. So are you saying you're not a fan of, of what Morgan's saying there or the No, I'm what, what absolutely are you saying, not. Max? I mean what what yeah, what's the what experience do you get from bringing drinks onto people on a pitch? Like when you could actually be playing cricket. Yeah. That's against not an experience. Better, against a better team than Sri Lanka as well. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, that is the sort of sad fact of the matter, isn't it? Um anything else for this game? I mean, like in the in in the in the the, the, the precap um that I did for for this chat. I did mention that Sri Lanka fought their way back into the game and they had England at AC for four after 11.5 overs. Um, 
it, it felt like maybe they were going to do something, Dan, or, or did you think even at that point um, with England only needing 100 and you know having 38 able, overs to do it and six wickets in hand that maybe maybe the game was dead? Well, look at England's batting depth compared to Sri Lanka's batting depth, and I think that kind of tells tells its own story, really. You know, it happened in one of the games in the T20s as well, with the one with the the bit of a rain delay. The the on the, if if you bat it down to like sort of seven, that might have been a problem. But when you bat down to ten, it's not really a major issue. You know, but David Willey was carded in at ten, which is insane depth, and even Mark Wood can bat a little bit as well. So so it's never really in any doubt, I don't think, and. Uh, the other thing with Sri Lanka as well is that once you bowl your better bowlers out a little bit, you have to then go down to the the next calibre of of bowling option, and then that that takes the pressure off a little bit for England as well. So then you have a you know a finite amount of premium bowling options, or or better than sort of or averagey bowling options, and and that's a, a major issue as well. Um, just before we move on to the second match, we had a few questions from Twitter that were all more or less the same thing. So Dev, G, Vinay uh, and Amit all asking something along the lines of what happened to Sri Lanka. Are they going to finish below Ireland in the in the World Cup qualifiers? Um, I mean, I, I, I did have in my notes that I thought, you know, this is the best ODI team against maybe the 12th best ODI team. And, and I think that looked like what it was. Dan, I don't know if you've got any thoughts. Are they going to make the World Cup? I think that Sri Lanka are extremely vulnerable in T20 t- matches against most teams. I, I, I mean, in the so, so the yeah. ODI world, yeah, well, that's that's a, yeah, yeah, world. yeah. Well, both really. I mean, you look at look at their boundary percentage over the three matches. Right, first match six point six seven percent. Second match eight percent. Third match five point six seven percent. Combines overall six point eight six percent. Right. Yeah. That's a m- same boundary percentage as a. Uh, reasonably attacking Red Bull batter. So that, that, that tells you how far they've got to go to put pressure on the better teams. And then you look at teams like Ireland, they have hitters. They've got Paul Sterling and they've got um, Gareth Delaney. They, they've got more intent than I think a lot of the Sri Lankan batting group. And yeah, I went through this. And I, just to, to wrap up this, then we're going to move on to the second one. England are better. India are better. Australia are definitely better. New Zealand are definitely better. West Indies are definitely better. Bangladesh, I think. You know, they beat yeah. West uh, Sri Lanka away. They're better. Um, South Africa are, you know, 100% better. Uh, Ireland, you know, could well be better, I think. Afghanistan, definitely. They're, yeah. They're, they're probably better. So that's nine teams. So Sri Lanka are at best 10th. Zimbabwe, I don't... Pakistan, sorry. We haven't mentioned Pakistan. So they're definitely 11th now. <laughs> um, I don't really know enough about Zimbabwe and 50 over cricket. I haven't seen them. I know they had an OK series. away or inter- like they, they weren't blown away by Pakistan in Pakistan recently. Um, or not in every game anyway. But, you know, it's probably questionable between those two sides for 12th in my mind. And... Scotland, I don't know anything about Scottish 50 over cricket, but I imagine Scottish people, you know, being as they are, would say that they are better than this. I know, I, I know a lot about Scotland, actually, and I, I would give them a pretty decent chance against Sri Lanka. So there we are. They could, they're could they 11th, 12th, 13th in the world by our, our estimations. That's a problem. Max, I know you had some stuff about how they can maybe get better. Do you want to talk about the second ODI first and, and then we'll get on to that? Yeah, why not? Um, so, second ODI, batting first once again, uh, Sri Lanka. Morgan was obviously keen for some early finishes in this series. The uh, Perhaps the football was on their mind on Tuesday for for deciding to, to bowl first. On um, on Thursday, I, I don't know what the explanation was. Uh, they obviously just decided that they'd had enough of the whole thing and wanted to, <laughs> wanted to see it off. <laughs> um, Sri Lanka obviously would have been hoping for a better batting performance than the first game. Uh, in particular, well, uh, aside from... Uh, Aside from Hasaranga, they'd probably been looking for uh, a bit of a better performance from their middle order um, to uh, back up Kusal Pereira. And uh, that, that kind of happened. Um, they uh, they brought in Dan Jaida Silva and he was quite unlucky not to reach 100. He scored a, a good 91 of 91 and he was supported well by uh, Dasman Shanaka, who scored a few runs on, on this tour, um, who scored 47. 
Uh, unfortunately for them, their top order completely flopped, and uh, Sam Curran, in particular, exploiting some good swing to take three early wickets meant that Sri Lanka were very quickly 21 for four. So uh, suddenly it was rather a rebuilding job all over again. Um, but, that, you know, there was a fight back, and it was quite a good fight back, especially from Dalanjaya, and uh, that meant that England did actually have to chase some runs this time. Um, but it was at the Oval, so <laughs> the score of 240 <laughs> was more like 10. And uh, <laughs> England's top four made a bit of a mockery of the 240-odd that they needed, and they cantered home with eight wickets and seven overs uh, to spare. I, I sort of thought... I was tempted at the halfway stage, knowing that Sri Lanka kind of had a half-decent bowling attack and that, you know, strange things happen in cricket, that I might put a couple of quid on Sri Lanka to um, to win, expecting the odds to be, you know, astronomical. And it was like 13 to 2. Oh, that's bad. I was just like, what? <laughs> I, would have, I mean, 240 against that England white ball team, I wouldn't have given Sri Lanka 15 to 1. Yeah, that's the sort think. of error I was thinking. Like, yeah. That I kind of that at the oval, but no, it good. was uh, yeah. The <laughs> well, well, once again, what is there to say? Um, um, well, what I thought was interesting, we should we should mention Sam Curran bowled pretty well. In the, yes, you, know, you can only beat who you're in front of. And uh, I actually um, quite quite interesting with the the Sam Curran bowling was the um, sort of the the degrees of swing that he was getting compared to to David Willey. So obviously. Uh, both left armers and both kind of trying to exploit swing early up. And I think David Willey is generally quite quite good at that. But uh, Sam Curran was uh, was comfortably out out swinging David Willey in, in his on his home turf. What well, well, I also thought was interesting was that later in the innings, the end of the Shl- well, Sri Lanka were kind of bounced out by two left armers bowling about 80, 80 miles, miles an hour. hour yeah, and, and that wasn't you know an amazing look. Um, Dan, we saw Dan and Jaya in this match. He's obviously you know. I don't know if you say lit up the test arena, but has been one of Sri Lanka's more positive notes in the last yeah. couple of years. Why were you surprised to only see him get into the team for this this match, in, or only make it into the team for this match in this series? Not really. Um, so obviously, as you say that that he's done all right in test matches before, uh, average of thirty eight is pretty solid, uh, certainly for a, a kind of a, a lower level team. Um, but his white ball strike rates are very, very bad. So overall, and that includes this series, he's in ODI is averaging 27 and a bit, strike rate of 78. T20s, average of just over 20, strike rate of 109. So Not great. 91 off 91 is about as good as you could possibly <laughs> have expected. Uh, and I think somewhat somewhat above his, above above where we would have expected him to. And it's also worth noting that in sort of Sri Lankan domestic cricket over his career in 50 overs, it's not really a great deal different either, those numbers. So, yeah, uh, he did good to do that, but whether that's... <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a massive surprise that he wasn't picked, picked earlier. Um, Max, we did also see Tom Curran come back into the side here. So we talked, touched on this a little bit earlier. England decided to drop or rest Wokes... Yeah. Um, I saw. You know, I think I saw someone played on Twitter. so many games. Yeah, I saw recently. someone on Twitter yeah. make a, a comment after he'd started bowling really nicely in the first ODI, saying, "Oh, Chris Wokes has taken a wicket, and uh, now he will be rested for the second <laughs> second game." <laughs> <laughs> um, Tom Curran, in particular, coming back into the team. Um, I know we have to talk about this sort of with what happened in the final match in mind, um, but that is odd, isn't it? They've obviously they've obviously made a, some sort of, uh, I guess, gut decision, haven't they, on Tom Curran? Like I think maybe we've seen in the test side. Um, we spoke about it a couple of weeks ago, and the sort of the reasoning behind sort of deciding that Zach Crawley is the man for for the test team to uh, you know to slot in at number three and strengthen the batting and some of the other picks as as well aren't really backed up by uh, any sort of uh, any sort of evidence from um, county championship be it averages or uh, weighted averages and uh, you know that kind of thing and um and it seems to be that they've they've done a similar thing with Tom Curran although sort of that's based on his international performance because obviously at a county level he's uh, he he has a reasonable record. His IPL record is uh, <laughs> rather rather less um, complimentary, but 
Um, I think actually with Tom Curran, what we saw in this series was the um, uh, sort of the support for for our theory that actually he's uh, he's very good at county cricket because he was bowling at that level, doesn't he? And uh, and performed pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I think it is a really interesting one. I, I can only assume. I mean, I, I tweeted out that I think I just think it's a huge failure of England's analytics team, basically, um, to to one not recognise that the results he's producing are, are dreadful, but also to you know have found another way. I think to justify him being in the team, and that's related to what I think they think it's a skill that he has in terms of that slower ball. But I, again, when you look, you can actually, you can break down um, the results of the slower ball that he bowls and it, it, it just isn't very good. It averages over 50. It gets hit all over the place. Everybody knows he's going to bowl it. It's not, it might have a lot of spin on it and it might have a lot of dip on it, but it's, it's somewhat irrelevant if you're playing against people who, uh, you know, can deal with it can deal with it yeah basically and they can and the fastball he bowls is not particularly scary as well um do you, do you guys think that with regards to england's sort of they have this reputation of being a data-driven team but i i can't from the outside at least i get the impression that they they use data to inform them in in game tactically but they seem to kind of disregard it when it comes to selection and for me, I don't understand that because if you've got so much faith in data to use it to drive your in-game strategy, why wouldn't you also use it to to drive selection? And it just kind of gives me that impression that they just use it when it suits them, when it suits them, when it when they've got they've got they've got their own agenda, they've got their own opinion on players, and, and that's not going to change them. No matter what, that's not going to change them. Yeah, I think that's probably a fair enough assumption to make that they, of the teams in, in world cricket, certainly in white ball cricket, in fact, no, I think even in red ball cricket, they seem to have among the best plans, particularly in the field. I think they mm. they tend not to, to fuck it up too. Like, I mean, occasionally you get someone, you know, that Adil Rashid bowling to Pat Cummins in the final over of a match when Australia <laughs> needed that. And you're a bit like, I'm not sure that was 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 exactly you know, the perfect planning there. But that was a little bit of a one-off. I mean, I think in general, England bowl in the right areas to the right batters. They, they, and uh, they, yeah, their in-game tactics are good. I mean, it's why they don't use that for recruitment is a bigger, is it, is it perhaps a factor point? that the, the data sort of strategy in game is driven by, you know, the whole, uh, deal with uh, with crickbiz and having that kind of data available which is a little more uh i guess micro oriented and that it is that kind of uh, you know where people are bowling what pitches are doing how much spin there is on it compared to the kind of things that we could just google i think to some extent that's true max in in, in terms of you know getting their best players to do the right thing with the ball. I don't think it necessarily applies with the bat. I think they they bat in a weird way. Not in white ball cricket, in test cricket. I'm, I'm talking here, but um, they if they have access to this data, then then and and that is informing their tactics. Then surely it can also sort of inform their decision to remove somebody who's obviously doing something wrong from the attack. Like they 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 must be able to see. Well, we not only do they have the same stuff we can Google with Tom Curran, they can see like where the slower ball's landing and, and, and why it's getting hit out of the stadium. Um, so why can they either not feed that back to Tom Curran or remove him from the team? Because it's it's the data is there yep. to, to make that call. Well, there, and like the, that 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 breakdown lies the, the slower question, balls, doesn't it, Jack? It's, it's that, the that breakdown of that breakdown of the slower ball breakdown I gave. Basically, I just to, to to talk about that in a little bit more detail. As the innings goes on. Tom Curran bowls more and more slower balls and they basically become less and less effective because it, like, so in the, at the death, Tom Curran bowls about a third of his delivery to the, uh, uh, or a third of his deliveries are off pace. Now that isn't stuff you can Google. That is from, uh, um, what do you call it? That's, that's Crickviz data, basically. That's what, what they're looking at to, to, to spread that. And I think it was a Crickviz tweet that, that I read. So why, if they're, you know, providing an analytics service to the England team. Are they not saying stop this man doing this at death <laughs> or, or or getting him out of the team? So, um, I mean, I, I, I think it's, I think it's tricky. I think basically they, 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 they've used it to justify certain things they do very well. 
But when the data suggests that their hunch is wrong, head in the sand, they then ignore it. I think I think they're they're, they're very good at patting. And actually, I mean, if you read, so on. basically, the ECB are an exercise in confirmation bias. Exactly. If you read this book, the the one the the hot book at the moment, Ben Jones and Nathan Lehman, they talk a lot about sacred cats and Chesterton and fences. It's it's a it's a it's it, long story. It's, uh, it it basically what what they're talking about uh, occasions when teams do things just because that's how things are done and and they should be challenged and maybe you should do something differently. And occasions when teams do things because they used to be done but they but that was the right thing to do and they go through a bunch of examples in their book about occasions when this is correct and this isn't correct but if you actually read the book very rarely do they say and this informed our decision to do this or this is why this is happening now what that book is and what the effectively the england analytics so that, team that is, book's not been uh, written in the star format I, no it is it, 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 what it is is a, is a, is a historical assessment of certain cliches in cricket history so it tells you why you shouldn't pitch the ball up all the time in England it tells you uh why Rahul Dravid was good against spin it you know it tells you about why the England 50 uh, 50 over team is good but none of those things they'd ever say at any point the England 50 over team are good because we used analytics and we recruited these players they basically show in that book that it was kind of an accident that this England team were good because they changed the format in in domestic cricket from fifty uh, from fifty overs to forty overs. The scoring rates went up. So this was back in about two thousand twelve. This is a bit boring, this answer probably. But when it and then and then a few years later they reverted back to fifty over cricket, but the scoring rates remained the same. So there was a whole shift for a domestic pool of players that are now the amazing England white ball fifty over team that happened more or less by accident. No one no one did an analytic. They, they they only sort of really noticed this after the fact as it were there's a, so there's a lot of observations like that and I'm, I'm not sure you know they have access to all this amazing information but i think basically the england team the or the, the data team what they're, they're they're quite good at doing is saying james anderson is amazing because james anderson is amazing they're not <laughs> necessarily telling you anything or telling james anderson how to be amazing or tom curran that he's got a mm. massive flaw in his, his change of speed uh, you know, it, it's, 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 all it's very, it's very retrospective analysis. Yeah. And I just don't think that's why I took from the book. Very interesting book, buy it, read it. And you will learn stuff about cricket, but you don't learn stuff about how to be an analyst, read it, or, then or, learn or how, how to use works. it better and get a better, get a job. At the <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you from personal experience, that's easier said than done because. Getting, <laughs> oh, getting, you would say that Dan. Getting analytics jobs is like, looking for a needle in a haystack um and 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 that's Send not your necessary. cvs to dan weston at saa advantage <laughs> <laughs> do you think that like with other guys like tom curran and and we talk about zach Crawley in the test arena as well do you think that there's like a large degree of like a sunk cost fallacy in that we've 100%. invested absolutely yeah. yeah yeah this is well this is morgan basically admitted this by saying we don't want to put people in for one game and we, we when we pick people we want them to just sort of be around the squad now you either say that because your team is actually amazing or or you say that because you feel like you have to make a huge investment in somebody before they can even get in your team in the first place. And I think that kind of gave away the psychology of some of this selection a little bit. Because it's not. Like you, on the in your right side. mind, you wouldn't pick Tom Curran. Yeah, but he doesn't right play in the first team, mind. does he? He's not He's not like in the first 11. He's That's playing fancy. here in their first team. Yeah, but we got no Stokes, no Archer. We had George Garton on the bench. We had, we had Wokes on the bench. And the, the irony is that he might now he's taken four for thirty five against a team who are arguably worse than the county team. That might actually elevate him higher in in Morgan's mind, and he might actually get picked more. And we've seen that a couple of times with Chris Jordan, who somehow hit hit a couple of boundaries later on, and some and now he gets ahead of the likes of uh, Joffrey Archer as a sort of a lower order hitter. And it's kind of that that sort of recency bias or doing it in front of someone. That I think makes that that big difference. And I think I think that anyone who doesn't use analytics to dis- determine both pre-match team selection and in-play strategy is hugely at risk of that recency bias and, and uh, what they call gambler's fallacy. So if any of the listeners haven't heard of gambler's fallacy, it's not actually really to do with gambling. It's actually just a human misconception, a psychological aspect of your brain where you, you, know, you notice 
more sort of noticeable events, if you like, you think that they happen more often than they actually do, and you forget the mundane stuff. So, like, for example, if you get a player who's done, scores 110 and 10, or 10, 10, 100, let's say, as opposed to 40, 40, 40, the guy who scored a ton in the last game gets the recency bias because and 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 that that extra that extra kind of weighting. So so it kind of overvalues random rare performances. You know, football match, you always remember the five four between random teams, but no one ever remembers the nil nil. So you think the five four happens more often than it actually does. And it's kind of that that's the kind of premise around it anyway. Yeah, just a final point on analytics, and, I, and, and then I know we maybe should talk about Sri Lanka because this is a complete. Yeah, we've, we've managed this to is, eviscerate the England setup. Also this is way <laughs> more interesting, though. Let's be honest, way more interesting than actually talking about this cricket match. Um, <laughs> um, so, final point on this: I, I always think with analytics that the the most compelling argument I've heard from someone that wasn't named Dan Weston was from Jared Kimber, who was an analyst for a little while. I think he did. I think he was the analyst for Scotland. He's been an analyst in I think the PSL and in the CPL. Uh, as, as well as being a, a well-known cricket journalist and uh, rival YouTuber. Um, he he says when he saw the analyst role more as due diligence for recruitment, basically, than as, you know, some money ball savant kind of, we've got all the answers kind of position. And, and I think the way he talks about that, breaking down like the decision to pick a player and the decision to, to or to pick, the decision to pick a player A in conditions, in these conditions and play, player B in these conditions and, you know, where to spend your money in a draft or who to invest your, your time in uh, from a youth perspective. He actually uses the example of James Vince and, and England and the county championships, the steps up from Division 2 to Division yeah. 1 and into the, 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 the top team, as you have done with Zach Crawley and Dan. To, to, to as an example of how that would be due diligence. Like it, it is, it is weird to expect somebody to who has a poor track record doing a thing to suddenly get good at doing that thing. But cricket teams yeah. do it all the time, and I think that style of analysis at this point in time seems to be more effective and produce better results and be more logical than the we can explain the whole of cricket type of analysis because yeah. nobody actually can do that compellingly at the moment yeah and i think what you're saying is so true because the or what jared's saying as well is that almost like the best thing you can do with analytics is help avoid making bad decisions and and, I, and that's exactly you know you talk about the james vince example or the zach court Craw- example there are others too um where it's just completely illogical that a guy's going to average more facing Mitchell Stark or, or Pat Cummins or, or whoever than they would have okay, some random 80 mile an hour county seamer. It's just it's just <laughs> so unlikely. And I, I I actually looked at all this before and very, very few um, batters in were able to average more in test cricket than they were in, in first class. So, you know, the numbers stack up to that obvious logical assertion as well. And Max, Sri Lanka, what's gone wrong for them? And um, how can we, we can breeze over the final game? Current at four wickets, it rained. Yep. There we Good. go. <laughs> Very um, accurate. <laughs> well done. Um, yeah, Sri Lanka. I mean, yeah, uh, we've um, we've gone in gone in a bit on England, and uh, that's a nice break from us going in on Sri Lanka because we're the best team in the world. No. It's 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 criticism with love. They're the yeah. best the best one day want, team yeah, in the world. Yeah, but... he's, he's always run for Not improvement. Perfect. Right? Yeah, you've got a better, always be your best self. Um, Agile. Sri Lanka at the moment. Improvement. Yeah, Sri Lanka, not their best self at the moment. Very much their no. worst self. Um, and have been for a good few years. There's um, the there's a bit of a trope, really. There's a bit of a, a thing that people like to say about Sri Lanka. They said it about Sri Lanka about nine or ten years ago, and they're saying it about Sri Lanka again. And it's just that they're a team in transition. And how do you, um, how you know, how how can you bounce back after losing uh, players like you know? In previous years, it would have been Jai Wardner, uh, Tilakratna Dilshan, that kind of uh, that kind of player, Chamindavas. You know, let's go, well, let's go way back. And um, and and you know, in recent days, we're talking uh, people like Malinga. Yeah, how 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 could you possibly come back when you lose someone who is a freak like that? I and mean, it's a fair point, but um, you would kind of uh, hope that in the period of 15, 20 years of Sri Lankan cricket, they might be able to um, come up with a few new faces who might be able to perform well. And um, I think just having that argument of uh, team in transition 
glosses over the structural problems that they've got in Sri Lankan cricket. And you sort of mentioned the question, uh, do you think they'll even qualify for the 50 over World Cup? Uh, you know, will they get out of their T20 World Cup group? It might almost be uh, the best thing for Sri Lanka that they don't and that they actually come and have a look at uh, the setup of Sri Lankan cricket and, and address things because there's a, f- um, a few issues. I think one of the most uh, obvious, if you look at it, is that they have 24 first class cricket clubs in Sri Lanka, which is absolutely insane. Uh, when you look at their population, um, and I, I think you compare, I think uh, Australia have a slightly larger population. They've got six uh, first-class teams. Um, yeah, England's got. It'd be like England having four what eighteen five counties? Like yeah, like it's it's um, and it just basically results in a massive dilution of the top talent, and they end up playing against, as Ross would say, playing against farmers. And that's not a that's not a breeding ground for um for for developing uh you know an international cricket team. You I mean you can also look at things like uh, infrastructure as well. You've got pitches that are generally dust bowls. It doesn't really prepare you for for having a you know a fast bowler that can stand up to the rigors of of Test cricket. But that's sort of a, a different issue. And we have actually seen their bowling's not too bad, um, but their batting is is really suffering, isn't it? And I think that is definitely a symptom of not playing against the top players in Sri Lanka. If you're going out and playing and having a great domestic season playing against a bunch of farmers in your 24 first class team setup, um, the you talk well again. You can liken it to the step up div two, div one, test cricket. You can't expect someone to perform better. You're talk, you're looking at like club cricket. But you might be playing against club cricket bowlers in England, that kind of standard. And then you're being thrown into an international sphere and it just doesn't work. So there, there needs to be, I think there needs to be really a, a, just a just a look at that and, and try and uh, try and re- revamp things. There's a few other very, uh, very it. nuanced and boring political aspects but, about like how many votes each for each club oh God, has yeah, I read, I read <laughs> moving to the board and it's, uh, we won't get into that but suffice to say there are there are too many uh fingers in the pie but i read a, i read a couple of things that were really illustrative of the points you're making there max one on the on the pitches i think in the last five years 90 percent. so if you look back each year the top 10 wicket takers in Sri Lankan yeah. cricket last five years nine out of ten every year have been finger spinners which is mm. not you know, ideal if you're trying to produce bowlers for the international level. The other thing is Sri Lanka going through more players at the international level than yes. anyone else because they have absolutely no idea who's good until yeah. they come up against somebody who actually is good because they are, as you say, playing against farmers in that in that lower level. It's- Maybe they need my algorithm. Have you got an algorithm <laughs> for them? <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, it would be like pretty straightforward to do. Well, I, I reckon I could sit in my office for a day or two and I would be able to pick a better team. They, Mickey Arthur, Tom yeah. Moody. He's going to find you five grand. Right, fellas, should we take a quick break? Then we'll come back. We've got a preview of Sri Lanka, uh, of, of England, Pakistan. We've got uh, some the women's cricket. We've got a little bit of 100, et cetera, et cetera. Yes? Yeah. You're listening to the Cricket Podcast. 